Good morning, I have Jeff Los Angeles. I'm glad to be here with all of you this morning. I wanted to take this moment to just welcome everyone. Welcome to this wonderful Thanksgiving Sunday, a very special Sunday indeed. Welcome to our first timers. If you are, if this is your first time visiting here, I just want to take this time to just personally welcome you. We are glad that you're able to join us. You know, truly, it is uh, a very trying time. Obviously, this season, this this holiday season, but. You know, there is always a reason to be able to give thanks unto the Lord. And once again, we're so glad you're here. And would you just bow your heads with me today and let's pray for our service. Almighty God, this morning, Lord God, we just want to take this time to truly give thanks to you. You are a great and awesome God, Lord God. And you are good. You are good, Lord God. Despite of all the happenings, despite of everything that is around us, Lord, we want to take this time, Lord God, to give thanks to you our King, our Lord, our Savior, because you are a good, good God. Lord God, let us celebrate, Lord God, this day with thanksgiving and dedicate it to you. We thank you. Bless our service this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a blessed service, everybody.
Jesus is waiting, God so loved the
Heavenly Father, Lord. We are so grateful. We are so grateful that even in this time when there's so much worry and so much uncertainty, Lord, that we can wake up every morning and know that we have received your mercy, that you have sung a song over us so that we can go through our day and have you by our sides. We love you so much, Lord, and we are so grateful, so grateful that we get these chances, Lord, to be with you, to sing to you, and to call you Father. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Sunday, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. If you are here for the first time, we're so glad that you came. I encourage you, take this moment to introduce yourself in the chat box and everyone else, make sure you give the warmest welcome possible. Also, if you're new, go to our website, ifgfla.com, fill out an online connect card. That way we can follow up with you. Another way that you can get connected is to join Next Steps. Next Steps is a four week membership class. It happens every Sunday after the service. It's online, super convenient, but basically this is a perfect class if you are interested in becoming a member, if you wanna know more about our church, or you wanna get more involved. So if that sounds like you, I encourage you to let me know in the chat box and I'll get you all set up. On Friday, December 4th, we are gonna have corporate prayer. This is a time for us to gather as a church to intercede for one another, to pray about other important matters in our community. And it's just a great time for us to come together. And we're gonna host two corporate prayer gatherings, one hosted by the Monrovia campus at 7.30 p.m. and one hosted by the Orange County campus at 8 p.m. So I encourage you, join one of those gatherings. Let's pray together and keep an eye out because we're gonna be sending the Zoom information very soon. This December, we have a lot planned, especially for Christmas. And so there are a few dates that I want you to mark on your calendar. First, on December 18th and 19th, that's Friday and Saturday, uh, we're planning to have a few in-person Christmas services. Now, because of COVID-19, these are tentative, but we're hoping that they can happen. Either way, we'll let you know, but mark your calendar for now, just in case we're able to have them. If not, at least we'll have a few online services. So we're gonna have a Christmas service on Sunday the 20th. That's gonna be at our normal Sunday service time at 10.30. We're gonna have music presentation, special sermon, and then we'll also have a very special Christmas Eve service that will be premiered on our YouTube channel. Again, it's gonna be a special message, perfect for inviting friends and family. We're gonna have worship, a few, th and we have a few other fun things planned. So make sure you mark your calendar for December 18th, 19th, 20th, and the 24th. Happy Thanksgiving, church. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving weekend. I'm here to announce that next Sunday, December 6th, is a very special Sunday, very important Sunday. I don't want you to miss it. So I want all of you to tune in 10.30 Sunday morning, December 6th, because we, the whole pastoral team, will be there. We're going to pray for Pastor Steffi and Ellen to promote Pastor Steffi and install him as the new IFJF Los Angeles lead pastor. Amen. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be wonderful we've been waiting for this for a while now because we were supposed to do this back in easter because that's when our 25th anniversary was also my 30th year of or uh, being ordained <laughs> so 2020 promised to be such an epic year just not in the way that we imagined it to be but uh, this is still 2020 we're gonna seize the day and we're gonna still do it this year right so uh, where am I going? Oh, I'm still here. I'm going to be here uh, the whole time uh, until I'm retiring in six years when I'm 65, right? So, but uh, there's a, a, just a role change here. Now, I'm ordained for life, so uh, I will always be a, a pastor here in IFGF LA, but functions can change. So I was uh, borrowing corporate speak. Uh, I was founder 
and then chairman of the board of the elders and then also the CEO. Now, uh, I'm just the chairman of the board and Pastor Steffi will be the CEO. So we want to support him. Uh, we want to make sure that he is successful in all the things he's trying to do for the betterment of and the progress of our church. I will be there uh, to, to support him as well. So I hope you join me in supporting him. All right. So uh, we'll see you next week. See you Sunday. Don't miss it. And God bless you. Happy Thanksgiving Sunday once again, church. I wanted to take this time first and foremost to say thank you. To thank you for those that supported our church. We know it has not been easy, especially during, during this time of pandemic. But, you know, I just first and foremost wanted to say thank you. We can't do any of this without you. Our production, our, our Sunday services, um, our, our service in person, next steps and etc. We cannot do this without your generous support. And this season of Thanksgiving, we, the church, is thankful for you. Now, you may have never given before, but you know what? You could do so now. And let me thank you in advance. Here's how you can give to our church. There are several ways. First, you can text your give to 77977. Type in IFGFLA space give if you are from Monrovia. IFGF OC space give from the OC campus. IFGF WLA space give from the West LA location. Or IFGF CNO space give from Chino. You will receive a link via text. Click that link and you will be taken to our secure giving portal powered by Pushpay. From here, you can choose whether to give a one-time gift or set up a recurring gift. You can also give through our website at www.ifgfla.com forward slash give. Select your campus and you can choose from there again whether you would like to give a one-time gift or set up a recurring gift. If you prefer to mail in your gift, you could still do so. Please send your checks to our office at 147 West Palm Avenue, Monrovia, California, 91016. The book of Jeremiah, verse 33, 11 says this, Give thanks to the Lord of heaven's armies, for the Lord is good. His faithful love endures forever. When you give, give it as a thanksgiving offering for God, because He is good and He loves you. His faithful love endures forever. Whether you feel like you love Him or not, He still loves you. And for that, we can always be thankful. So today, Look, give it as a thanksgiving offering because again, he is a good God. And you know what? The church will use these gifts to spread his good news throughout the city, the country, and the world. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for this opportunity to be able to give unto you, Lord God. Father, we pray, Lord, for every generous hands, Lord God, that's given today. Father, bless everything that we bring forth today, Father. Bless our tithings, our offerings, our, give, our, giving of, uh, our giving of alms, our mission gifts. Father, bless it in accordance to your riches and your glory as your people give with joy today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, church. Good morning, church. Happy Sunday. Happy Thanksgiving. I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving, spending time with your family. I hope you had a lot more self-control than I did because I had too much to eat. I ate more than I should. I ate more than my tummy could handle. I probably gained, I don't know, 30, 40, 50, 50 pounds over the weekend. It's crazy the amount of food that I consumed. But... Um, we have a lot to be thankful for. Amen. And it's a wonderful time. It's an amazing uh, day to be coming together, worshiping Jesus together. It's awesome. It's awesome. And we are in this series, Chin Up. Chin Up. It is very easy for us to uh, be seeing things negatively, being pessimistic about things. But this morning, as we are concluding this series, I would like to give an encouragement from this wonderful story from the Bible. It's from the Old Testament part of the Bible, and it's from the book of 2 Kings chapter 4. The book of 2 Kings chapter 4, and uh, if you have your Bible with you, um, let's turn to the book of 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, and I'm going to read it from the message translation. The book of 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. 
7. Here we go. One day the wife of a man from the guild of prophets called out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. You well know what a good man he was, devoted to God. And now the man to whom he was in debt is on his way to collect by taking my two children as slaves. Elisha said, I wonder how I can be of help. Tell me, what do you have in your house? Nothing, she said. Well, I do have a little oil. Here's what you do, said Elisha. Go up and down the street and borrow jugs and bowls from all your neighbors, and not just a few, all you can get. Then come home and lock the door behind you, you and your sons, pour oil into each container. When each is full, set it aside. She did what he said. She locked the door behind her and her sons. As they brought the containers to her, she filled them. When all the jugs and bowls were full, she said to one of her sons, Another jug, please, he said. That's it. There are no more jugs. Then the oil stopped, and she went and told the story to the man of God, which was Elisha. And he said, Go, sell the oil, and make good on your debts. Live both you and your sons, on what's left. You know, there's so many challenges in 2020. And the paradox of 2020 is there's too much hate, not enough love. Too much needs, not enough supply. Too much fear, and not enough peace. Too much bills, not enough jobs. It is very easy for us to be pessimistic, to be cynical, to be skeptical, to be negative, to be worried and anxious, to be fearful. I mean, 2020 has been challenging financially, especially for a lot of people. But the challenge also, we are living in a culture of consumption. During the eight months of quarantine, I noticed UPS FedEx, DHL, USPS drivers show up every day on my street. Uh, I heard Amazon is doing great. Not only we work from home, we go to school from, we do school from home, we also shop from home. Amazon is having their, one of their best years from what I heard. And that's a tension, a culture of consumption and God's economy. And the Bible mentions money and possessions over 2,000 times in the Bible. God knows that money and things are the number one competition for your heart. The Bible says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Do we believe things about to run out? Or we believe that there is more from where it came from? Do we live on the land of scarcity or lack, or we live on the land of abundance? The book of Haggai, chapter 1, verse 6 says, You have sown so much and bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You, are, you clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Anyone can relate? And you feel that, I just can't get ahead. The thing is, when it comes to scarcity or abundance, it starts in the heart, not in the wallet. Scarcity or abundance starts in the heart, not in the wallet. Because scarcity or abundance is a mindset. It's a mindset. Scarcity mindset says, there is not enough. And also, scarcity is a cycle. I mean, God supplies. Uh, we consume, then we lack, then we fear, and then we consume again to medicate our fear. Just look at the great toilet paper run of 2020. I don't get it. I don't get it. If people are, you know, Worried about not having enough food to eat. I mean, it makes more sense. But toilet paper, which is bizarre. 
You know, I, would ima- I could imagine 50 years from now, history teachers in explaining the great toilet paper run to the students, the students were probably convinced or believed that COVID-19 was the great diarrhea virus. It's a deadly diarrhea, diarrhea virus. But if we have the scarcity mentality, we think that it's never enough. We always lack. But the Abundance mindset says there is more than enough. There is more than enough. And because we have a different source, we have a different provider. The book of Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond. Let me repeat it one more time. Now to him, God, who is able to do far more abundantly beyond, beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. For those who are in Christ, we have that access to the one who is able to do far more abundantly beyond. All we can think of, all we can ask, according to that power that works within us. Everything about God is excessive, is extravagant, exponential. Our God is the God of more than enough. You know, from God's perspective, scarcity is not normal. Abundance is. As far as God is concerned, scarcity is not normal, but abundance is. Adam and Eve didn't have to worry about food. I mean, upon creation, God said, there's so many trees. You can enjoy the fruit from every tree in this garden. There there, there are a lot of them except one. Don't eat from this one tree, but you can eat from all the other trees. There's plenty. Adam and Eve did not have to worry about food because there was plenty of food. They did not work to survive, but to steward the garden. They did not work for food, but for fellowship with God. God gave them the assignment, take care of the garden, and they were doing it together They were enjoying their fellowship. They did not work for food. They did not have to worry about food. That was before the fall. After the fall, scarcity, before the fall, scarcity was not normal. Abundance was. Scarcity, poverty, sickness, death was abnormal, was unnatural, was non-existent. There was no pain. There was no suffering. There was no death before the fall. But after the fall, everything was broken. Everything was not working. Scarcity, poverty, sickness, pain, suffering, sorrow, death becomes normal, becomes natural. That's why in the world we live in, when somebody who has a terminal illness got healed, then we call it supernatural. It's not normal. It's a miracle. It's a miracle is something that happens that is not normal. But it was not, it's not always that way. When we were created, when the world was created before the fall. There was no death. There was no pain. There was no suffering. There was, there was no sickness. That's the norm. That's, that's normal. But because of the fall, sickness, scarcity, poverty, pain, suffering, death became a part of the human experience. The fall really messed it up for us. But the good news is God has a different plan for us. God has a different plan for us. John chapter 10 verse 10 says, The thief 
comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And I came so that they would have life and have it more abundantly. Not only God wants to give us life, wants us to enjoy life, but he wants us to have it abundantly. It's amazing. It's wonderful. Scarcity was part of the fall. It's part of our normal daily life now because of the fall, but because of Jesus. The Bible says he came he died. He suffered for us. He was broken so that we can be made whole. He went through all the pain and suffering so that we could be healed. And the same thing. Our curse was broken. He died for us so that we don't have to die, so that we can have eternal life. He broke the curse. He broke the power of sin and death. And at the same time, he broke the power of everything that was broken because of the fall. Scarcity is a cycle that can be broken. And the story that we just read today, the context was there was a king in Israel during, during their time. And it's an evil king, a bad one. He was leading the people of God away from God and he led them to worship idols, idols, false gods. But the prophet and his family were the few people who still, were, who still fear God, who still, they still worship God, they still honor God. And the husband died and she was left with a big debt that she couldn't pay. Creditors were coming after her, asking for the debt to be paid. And the Mosaic law allowed you to enslave others to settle the debt. So her sons were about to be enslaved. She was desperate. Maybe the year 2020 has done something similar to you. Maybe you lost your source of income. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you lost your business. Maybe your hours got cut significantly. And you are just scraping for pennies. You're trying to survive. And maybe you found yourself in a very similar situation and you are desperate. But the good news is God has broken the curse. God has broken all the things that were broken he came to give us life and life more abundantly. There are three principles that I'd like us to learn this morning to break the cycle of scarcity or the three principles of provision. If we go, if we go back to uh, verse 2, it says, Elisha said, I wonder how I can be of help. Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she said, nothing, nothing. The first thing that I'd like us to learn is this. Do not undervalue what you have. Do not undervalue what you have. I mean, I do not blame her. You know, when she said nothing. You know, the Bible says it's a jug of oil, and we're thinking probably, you know, a jug about, I don't know, this big, this big. But according to a commentary that I read, it was most likely only like a flask of oil, not a jug, like a big jug. It's, it's more of like a flask of oil. Probably the amount of oil that she had was enough to do a bowl of tossed salad. You know, it's ridiculously small, and that's all she had. But regardless of how small it was, it was not nothing. It was still something, no matter how small or insignificant it was. You know, we often, without realizing, we would say that or think that of the things that we have in our lives. Oh, it's nothing. 
it's nothing. I mean, my job is boring and it's low paying. It's a minimum wage kind of job. Well, you know, I, don't, I only have a high school degree. It's nothing. Oh, I only have a, an AA degree. It's nothing. Oh, I only have a bachelor's degree. It's nothing. I mean, you know, I don't have a master's degree like so-and-so or I don't have a PhD like so-and-so. I just graduated from just a no-name college or uh, just a technical school. I mean, it's not a prestigious school. I'm just an employee. I'm not a business owner. Oh, I'm just a part-time worker, not a full-time worker. Uh, you know, my business is small. I'm just a small distributor. Oh, my husband doesn't make that much money. Or I'm a renter, not a homemaker or a homeowner. My house is small, my car is old, my kids are loud. I mean, we often see things that we have in our lives as nothing. We don't realize that no matter we see them, they are still a blessing from the Lord. And just like this widow, I had nothing. And she didn't really have nothing. She had a, a flask of oil. Oil, no matter how small it was, it was still a blessing from the Lord. I mean, the scarcity, scarcity mindset is often fixed on what we lack. But abundance mindset asks, what do I have? Why do I have? I mean, if we adjust our perspective a little bit, we, will, we might realize that we actually have more than we think we have. I mean, the farmer would never harvest a crop if he always diminished the tiny insignificance of the seed. He doesn't see it for what it is, but for what it will produce when planted. The first principle I'd like us to learn this morning to break the cycle of scarcity or a principle for us to experience provision is do not undervalue what you have. Do not undervalue what you have. You know, of course, when she was being asked initially, her answer was nothing. But then she said, well, I do have a little oil. I do have a little oil. And the next thing that I'd like us to learn is this. God often does the extravagant through what seems insignificant. God often does the extravagant through what seems to be insignificant. And the Bible talks about how all we need is a faith of a mustard seed to move the mountain. It's not the other way around. It's not a faith of a, a mountain. It's faith of a mustard seed. It was just a flask of oil to fill a room full of jars. A room full of jars from a flask of oil. I mean, God will do the exponential when we saw the seed in faith no matter how small. And that principle is best demonstrated through the principle of the tithe. In the Old Testament, there was this command that was given to the people of God, it's called the tithe. And here is um, the command. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. This is from the book of Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And then God says, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Wow, it is so exciting because God gave a command and then he said, test me if, if I will not throw open the floodgates. I mean, that sounds so violent, like he's going to throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be no room enough to store it. And that's what the widow experienced. All she had that she called nothing was still a flask of oil. And she was told to go to your neighbors, go ask for as many jars as you could. And she was able to collect jars, bowls, big, small, to fill her whole house 
and she was told, uh, pour out that, that flask of oil into each of the jar that you have in your house. And with that small flask, like a room full of jars filled with oil. I mean, the storehouse in the Old Testament means, meant the temple. In the New Testament, in the, in the current time, it's the local church. And it matters to God that there's resources in the local church. Because in the local church, God has a mission. Through the local church, God wants us to go and make disciples of all nations. Why a percentage, not an amount? So that everyone could experience the miracle of God's provision. I mean, imagine, well, bring, each person needs to bring $50,000. I mean, not everybody can participate in that. But it's a, a percentage, a, a tenth, 10%. So a 10-year-old can give 10% of his allowance. 10% of minimum wage is not nothing. When you bring it into the storehouse, God can do so much. And the Bible says, test me. I mean, you probably have heard that, you know, there are verses in the Bible that says, do not test the Lord your God. Do not test the Lord your God. I mean, you don't want to do that. He's God, and we're not, we're not supposed to test God. God is the one who's supposed to test us. But this is an exception. This is the only place in the Bible in which God gives a command and he said, test me. There's a command and there's a promise attached to it. Test me if I am not going to keep my promise. Give you this command. Give 10% of your income and then see. That it will open up floodgates of heaven, doors of heaven, and bless you so abundantly until you do not have the capacity to store the blessings. That's the only place in which God challenges us to test Him. It is amazing, just from the 10%, God is able to do the extravagant. God often does the extravagant through what seems insignificant. And verse 3, here's what you do, said Elisha. Go up and down the street and borrow jugs and bowls from all your neighbors. And not just a few, all you can get. Then come home and lock the door behind you. You and your sons pour oil into each container when each is full, set it aside. She did what he said. She locked the door behind her and her sons. As they brought the containers to her, she filled them. When all the jugs and bowls were full, she said to one of her sons, Another jug, please. And he said, That's it. There are no more jugs. And then the oil stopped. Not only God is able to do the extravagant through what seems insignificant, God's abundance often follows our dependence on God. God's abundance often follows our dependence on God. In other words, faith. Faith in God. Trust God. Believe in God. I mean, she trusted. She had faith. So she obeyed, and her obedience was a demonstration of her dependence on God. She trusted God, and she obeyed. I mean, she was being given pretty awkward, strange, weird instructions. Go up and down the street, borrow jugs and bowls from all your neighbors. Like all of a sudden, hey, can I borrow your, you know, do you have any, any jugs, bowls? I mean, like, can you imagine the kind of questions they, she would receive? Like, wait, what, what's, what's going on? I mean, well, you know, I told Elisha, the prophet, that I don't have enough oil and, you know, creditors are coming after me. They're going to take my kids away. And then when I told him about that, he told me to get jugs from the neighborhood. 
And what for? What for? And can we imagine how awkward it was? Like, did, did an oil tanker just land on your roof or something? But out of faith, she did what she was commanded to do. And then the next instruction was, pour oil into each container, and when each is full, set it aside. I mean, there a room full of jars, big jars, bowls, jugs. And then what she had was a flask of oil. Can you imagine, like, how long it took? Can you imagine, like, wait, how is it going to work? I only had this much, but there are a bunch of jugs and jars and bowls to be filled. But she did what was commanded. It was awkward, and the command was weird and strange, but she did it by faith. She did it by faith. I mean, she could have thought, man, this is my last uh, flask of, of oil. This is all I have. I could imagine this pro- she was probably like, wait, what is this prophet is trying to do? But she obeyed. She obeyed. She let go. She emptied that flask of oil that she had. You know, I mean, sometimes we have this backward thinking that we need to get more in order for us to pour. Sometimes we think that we need to get more before we can pour. But faith thinking is that we pour, then we will get more. Because if we have the abundance mindset, if our faith is in the one who is able to do far more, beyond what we can ask or think of, if that's the one that we are dependent on, then we believe that as we pour, there will be more. No matter how small it is, a flask of oil, as we pour it, we believe by faith, God, as we let go, as I let go, you will provide. I mean, jar after jar until there was no more jar left. She was not only wishing to be provided, but she was also willing to believe and to act in faith. I really love this quote by Charles Spurgeon. Um, Spurgeon was a, a preacher, British preacher. And this is from one of his sermons on the passage. She did what she was commanded to do. She did it in faith. And the result answered the end. God takes care to deliver his servants in ways that exercise their faith. He would not have them be little in faith, for faith is the wealth of the heavenly life. Let me repeat it one more time. Faith is the wealth of the heavenly life. Did you realize everything that you do by faith, out of faith in Jesus, you accumulate your treasures in heaven. Every single decision, every single action, everything that you do out of faith, you are building up your wealth in heaven. I mean, we could be, it's not about the actions. It could be the same action, but it can be done out of pride. It can be done like, I'm going to prove it, that I can get out of the situation. You know, I have, I'm smart enough to get out of my situation right now. I'm, I have a lot of debt, but I think, I have a finance degree from a prestigious university. I'm going to be able to figure things out. I'm going to get out of this, and I'm going to come out ahead. Not out of pride, not out of trying to, you know, prove yourself, but truly coming out of dependence on God, coming out of faith. That as you do anything out of faith, you pile up your treasure in heaven. That's why the Bible says, Wherever your 
how your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Whatever you do out of faith. I mean, the Bible talks about how without faith it is impossible to please God. But we are pleasing to God when we put our trust and dependence on Him. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 7 says, In this, in all this, you greatly rejoice, though you do now for a little, while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire. Many times God allows us to go through a season of, of hardship, a season of scarcity. But the reason is not for us to try to figure things out on our own, trying to fight back, trying to battle our situation with our own strength and our own might. The purpose is for us to learn dependence on God. Because remember, He is the one who is able to do exceedingly, to do far more beyond what we can think of, what we can ask for. As we do that, our faith is being refined, that our, 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 grow, our, 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 our trust in God is growing as we learn to put our dependence on Him. I mean, this widow experience a powerful miracle when she begins to pour god begins to give her more it was just a small flask of oil but because of faith in god uh, a room full of jars were filled were filled with oil enough to pay her creditors and enough for them to survive and for them to live the kids were set free God's abundance often follows our dependence on God. Amen. You know, looking back on, on my life when I felt like I was spiritually stuck, it was usually during the times when I stopped pouring and started storing. When I began just holding back. And I look back in those periods, seasons in my life, that's when I experienced um, just spiritual stagnancy. If that's where you are, some of you are experiencing right now, you feel like you're spiritually stuck. Maybe give your way out of it. Give your way out of your spiritual stagnancy. Let go. Your finances, resources, let go of grace. Give compassion to people. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8 and 11. And God, is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Verse 11, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God, to God. Do you have the faith to pour? Because God will give you more. You and I belong to the God of more, to the God of abundance, to the God of more than enough, to the God of the impossible. Because abundance mindset, we believe that there is more from where it came from. You know, something that I... I noticed as I was studying this passage, if we go back to um, verse 1, I want you to observe a couple of things. One day the wife of a man from the guild of prophets called out to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead. You well know that a good man he was, devoted to God. And now the man to whom he was in debt is on his way to collect by taking my two children as slaves. Do you notice there's uh, the, the widow stone? It's like she accusing Elisha, blaming, like demanding an answer. Like, your servant, 
You know, he served you. He served God. He honored God. I mean, in the midst of, of this wicked pe people, I mean, the king is leading the people astray. The, the, the rest of the, the, the nation, they, they were idol worshipers. But my husband, he was steadfast. He served the Lord. He honored the Lord. He feared the Lord. Your servant is dead. It's like she was blaming Elisha. And she could have, said, she could have just said, my husband is dead. I mean, Elisha did not need, you know, a, a, an explanation that her husband was also his, one of his servants. I mean, he would have known who, his, who her husband was. And then also she said, you know, he was a good man, devoted to God. It's like she's also trying to blame God. What, what happened? I thought when we are devoted to you, when we serve you, when we give, when we tithe, when we volunteer, when we do things for you, then we're not going to die. Then we're all going to be, you know, happy and, and everything's going to be hunky-dory and, and nothing bad's going to come uh, upon us. Why is he dead? I'm sorry, but there are two things that are certain in life. Taxes and death, according to Ben Franklin. And everybody's going to die. And she was like blaming Elisha. Why is my husband dead? And Elisha's answer was less than... Um, doesn't, didn't really show any empathy or sympathy. What shall I do? What do you want me to do? Tell me what do you have in the house. I mean, if her husband was a prophet, a God-fearing man, chances are she was also a God-fearing woman. Chances are she also believed in God. Chances are the sons also believed in God. So I feel that as Elisha was asking, what do you want me to do? Tell me, what do you have? What do you have in the house? I feel that Elisha was like, hey, I know your husband. He was a good man. He was God-honoring. He was God-fearing man. And I know you too, you and your sons have put your faith in God. In the midst of this wicked generation, in the midst of, you know, idol worshipers, you're surrounded by them, but you still follow God. Would you believe in Him again? Would you put your faith in Him again? Would you trust Him? Regardless of your circumstances, would you believe in God again? Regardless of your circumstances. You know, I mean, we all have probably gone through, there are these two different seasons in our life. A season in which we have to ask, um, am I going to put $20 of gas in my car? Or a season in which we can just, well, just fill it up. Just fill it up. I remember going through a season when I had to think about, um, Am I going to just fill it, filling up my car, the gas, or am I just, or am I, or I can only afford $20 of gas? It's challenging. It's hard. But then as you learn to put your trust in God and God began to provide for you with more, then we begin to collect more stuff then the stakes are higher. Then letting go becomes a lot more difficult. I feel that what God is trying to tell this widow, well, you've been putting your trust in me. You've been putting your faith in me. Your husband did. Would you also believe? Would you also put your trust in me? I mentioned about the fall in the beginning. Before Adam and Eve fell, scarcity was not normal. Pain, suffering, death, sickness, 
poverty, lack. They were not normal. Because as far as God concerned, when the world was created, everything was good. But the fall messed it up for us. And what happened at the fall? Yeah, Adam and Eve disobeyed God. But what did it really mean? What happened was God told them something. But they did not believe in His Word. When God said, You can eat from any tree in this garden except for this one. There are plenty of them. You could eat from any tree except for this one. And we call their action as disobedience, but ultimately what they did was God told them something and they did not believe in his word. Do we believe in, in God? Do we believe in His Word? Do we believe that His ways are better than ours? Do we believe that His thoughts are better than ours? Do we believe that truly that the God that we serve is the God of abundance, the God of the impossible, the God of more than enough? Amen. This morning I want to pray for, for us. If there's any of you who are saying this morning, Steph, I, I've been so dependent on, on things, on things I can see, on things I can touch, on things here in the natural realm. I want to learn dependence on God. I want to learn to trust God. If that's you, would you please just say, yes, God, that's, that's me. I want to be set free from my dependence on material things and I want to learn dependence on you. Would you just say yes in your heart and let me pray for you. Father God, I, I'm praying for all of us. We, we want to see we want to touch because things that we can see, we can touch, we can hear, they give us assurance. They give us the, the illusion of control. We think we are in control. We think that, yeah, we are secure. And since the fall, we have become so insecure. There's nothing that is within us our control. Even the times when we think we're in control, we're never in control. So this morning with humility, we come before you, God, as we are saying yes to wanting to learn dependence on God and not on material things. God, help us. Help us. As we learn to pour, help us to believe that you will give more as we learn to give financially, help us to believe that we will never be lacking financially. Lord, help me. Help us to, to have the faith to tithe. Knowing that there is a command that comes with a promise. There's nowhere else in the Bible in which you say, test me. So, Lord, we are saying this with humility. So, as we give, we want to say, we want to, Lord, yes, we are responding to your word that says, test me. As we learn to pour, Lord, we believe that you will give more. Lord, I pray for every person who is saying yes this morning, who, who wants to learn dependence on God. Set us free and give us the faith to trust you. You who are able to do far 
more beyond what we can think of exceedingly abundantly more than what we can ask or we can think of thank you lord in your name we pray amen you know the story doesn't end until verse 7 and verse 7 says she went and told the story to the man of God and he said go sell the oil and make good on your debts live both you and your sons on what's left she only had a flask of of oil her sons were about to be taken away she probably are gonna we're gonna use the was gonna use the the oil just to cook something up for her and then she's gonna die but because she responded in faith she was able to pay all her husband's debts and she got her sons back and Elisha said live live you know that because of our sin we had a huge debt a debt so enormous ginormous that we cannot even pay we are not qualified to pay our own debt it is a result of our sin but God had a different plan he gave his one and only son to die on the cross it is an action that was done to pay all of our debt a result of our sin he paid it all and with that for those who believe by faith of what he did at the cross we are going to receive eternal life it was given by grace for free to us but it was not cheap because Jesus paid the price so this morning I want to ask maybe you're saying Steph um, I grew up in church I I was not so sure about about this whole Christianity but this morning I really wanna I want to be made right with God some of you you you, you probably you are a Christian but you f you feel you're distant from the Lord and this morning you're saying I really want my relationship with God to be restored if that's you would you allow me to pray uh, for you or would you allow me to uh, to pray with you Just follow after me let's pray Lord Jesus thank you for the cross thank you for paying all of my debt Lord Jesus forgive me of all my sins be my Lord and my Savior from this point forward guide me and lead me let your will be done in my life help me to live my life according to your ways and your will thank you Jesus in your name I pray if you just said that prayer um, for the first time the Bible says you just became a child of God and if you just made that very important decision in your, in your life would you please do me a favor Go to our website, ifgfla.com, and then click connect. Fill out a connect card, and then somebody will be in touch with you. Okay? All right. Let's end the service with a benediction. Father, we thank you this morning. We are thankful as we celebrated Thanksgiving. Lord, we want to learn to be thankful for everything that we have everything that you have blessed us with, everything that we've been entrusted with. Lord, they're not nothing. They're not nothing. 
There are many things that we have that we often take for granted. We often undervalue. We often look, look down. But Lord, we want to learn to be grateful. We want to learn to be content. We want to learn, God, to, uh, to be thankful because every single thing that we have in our life is a blessing from you. So Lord, teach us teach us the year 2020 has not been easy it has been challenging but help us as your people as your children to learn to be grateful to count our blessings thank you god thank you lord lord help us to finish the year strong we pray for your protection for uh, people keep uh, everybody safe uh, everybody healthy keep us from getting sick Father, we pray especially for our um, uh, uh, healthcare workers who are on the front lines on this uh, battle against pande the pandemic. Um, we pray for members of our church who are nurses and doctors, lab workers, lab technicians, God, everybody who works in the healthcare industry. Lord, we pray for your uh, protection, extra protection. Shield them from getting uh, COVID-19, from getting sick. And we pray that you may use their hands uh, to, uh, to, to bring about your healing uh, power upon every patient that they provide, they're providing care for. Thank you, God. And church, receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord shine his face upon you and give you peace. The Lord turn his face toward you and show you his favor. Receive the blessing of the Lord in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, which is in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Happy Sunday, everybody. Wow, what a powerful service and a timely word from our pastor, Pastor Steffi. If you were encouraged by today's service, I want to ask you to share this service on your social media platforms. You never know how God could use this service to bless someone else in your life. Also, if you are encouraged and you want to support our mission to connect with God and make disciples, consider prayerfully making a financial gift. It's as easy as texting the keyword I have Jeff LA give to 77977. And I hope you have a victorious week and may God bless you richly in the days ahead. Take care.